Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm really excited and looking forward for my next educational uh, talk or, you know, uh, on the, you know, focused on security and hardware wallets, Bitcoin only hardware wallets, and that is Bitbox02. So I'm really looking forward to have my next talk with Douglas Backholm, the CEO of Shift Crypto uh, in the companies in Switzerland. He's the co-founder and CEO. And so check them out uh, and go to put those in the, show, in the show notes. And you can also find them on uh, Twitter and on the website that shiftcrypto.ch. And uh, yeah, and it's about, uh, you know, uh, facilitating the decision making process on how to, uh, you know, make making trade offs or deciding what is most com- not only most comfortable for you, but how, where do you feel? How do you feel most more secure and more? And, and relaxed, uh, you know, handling, operating a hardware wallet. Um, so there's a lot of questions. And since we are, you know, most of us are not security experts and I had, you know, after talking to Stefan Snigurev, thanks to him, I also got a list of questions, uh, not only for my, uh, for my former guest, uh, uh, Lixon Liu, uh, the creator of the air-gapped hardware wallet, Cobo Vault. But now we're really looking forward to talking to Douglas Buckham, the CEO of Shear Crypto. And yeah, uh, please like it, retweet it, reach, share it with other you know people. Uh, thank you so much again for support and for listening. Make sure you follow me and subscribe on Twitter, YouTube, podcast platforms, what have you. So that's what I do to my talk with Douglas Backham. Yeah. All right. Welcome to the show, Douglas Backham. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, thanks you for your time and um, yeah, Douglas. Um, I've been, to be honest with you, I've been using, uh, testing and using uh, the the Bit- Bitbox, the Bitcoin only hardware wallet, Bitbox02 for quite some time. But before, you know, we go into all these details, why don't you introduce yourself to my listeners and our viewers? Uh, but uh, what I'm really curious, like, how did you, how did you land in that position? Uh, uh, what's your path to Bitcoin? What, do you, what is Bitcoin for you? Yeah, just a little bit about yourself. <laughs> yeah, sure. So... Um, yeah, very happy to be here. Ha- happy to have a conversation with you. Uh, so yeah, my past, um, I have quite, uh, I'd say mixed past, a uh, diverse past. Um, I first heard about Bitcoin in the summer of 2013. Uh, and it was actually, uh, I was in Japan at the time in Tokyo and it was on the front page of a newspaper, uh, in Japan. And I was like, this is really strange. Why, why? like a, a well-respected main newspaper in Japan. I'm like wondering why do they have monopoly money as a on the front page topic? <laughs> so then I, I got curious um, uh, and I started researching it. Um, and yeah, it, it clicked for me pretty quickly, um, like the importance of it. Uh, I, I come from uh, a scientific background. Um, and uh, so I guess the more of the academic, the research uh, aspects interested me more, in particular solving the Byzantine generals problem. So uh, basically have, uh, be able to trust something online that you don't have to trust the counterparties for. Uh, and that to me was really, really uh, special. I was like, wow, okay, there's something here. I didn't know exactly what was there yet, uh, but I knew that something special was there. And that, that was kind of the entrance of the rabbit hole for me. And uh, it's been, I guess, downhill, downhill, deeper and deeper ever since. <laughs> and so, um, in the past, though, yeah, I, I came from an academic background. So actually, uh, before um, uh, getting into Bitcoin, um, I was a neuroscientist. Uh, so I have a PhD oh, really? in neuroscience. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I studied the brain. <laughs> so and, it comes uh, with precision. The precision part, I think, is then <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So I would say. Um, yeah, I, people ask me all the time, well, what's the link? What's the link? <laughs> I can't really say there is a link uh, other than, I guess I've always been attracted to uh, things that I think can change the world. And so the brain is a really unknown, uh, unknown field. Um, a lot to learn, I think that obviously can change the world. And I think Bitcoin in addition is something that um, uh, will will change the world in profound ways. And so it's it's fun to be a part of part of each of these. Uh, and so I'd say, um, uh, why did I switch into Bitcoin? Uh, I guess at the time, the next step in my career, my academic career would be looking for a professor position. Um, 
And yeah, I wasn't sure exactly if I wanted to do that or not. Um, and I was thinking, okay, what should I do? What should I do? This other Bitcoin field looks kind of interesting. And I figured, um, you know, if, I, if I'm a professor, it's kind of similar to a startup also, where you have to convince someone you have a good idea, convince them to give you money, the government in this case with grants, for example, uh, convince other people to join your team to work on it, um, and so on and so on. But then in the end, you know, the, the, the reward is a bit different. Uh, so if you, have, if you have a startup and you do successful, it's a, it's a bit of a different situation than it's academic. Uh, and so on. And so then I decided, okay, how could I get into the field? Um, just decided to start a company and give myself a job. I figured, I didn't think anyone was gonna give a neuroscientist a job in, in there. So might as well try to do it myself. That's and- a, That's a <laughs> story. Okay. Cause when you said neurology and um, I was thinking about this interview when Elon Musk, I don't want to go into the, you know, into this, any other tangent now, cause it would just overwhelm people probably. but. I was thinking of this interview where Elon Musk was talking to Joe Rogan about Neuralink. I'm like, I was going to ask, like, uh, is is going to? Do you think it's going to be a time where we don't need any kind of hardware devices or hardware wallets? You know, we just Neuralink ourselves to <laughs> to the Bitcoin network. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm I'm happy to go down these tangents. <laughs> I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so yeah, my my uh, my neuroscience studies was actually trying to. Uh, investigate how individual neuron cells can talk to each other, how that can lead to learning and memory. Uh, what are the rules they use to do that? And so neural interfaces is a, a related topic to that. Um, but I think, you know, people coming from more of the AI side or the computational side, they really underestimate what's actually going on in the brain. It's a lot. And so like even in one neuron, you have so many sub subcellular processes happening that it's, it's more immense than any, any computer in existence. And so, and what I learned from the brain is that basically any type of physical phenomenon that exists and that's accessible to the neurons, they're gonna use it for computation. And so uh, there's, I would say an overall underappreciation for the complexity in the brain. And I would say it's, it's uh, you can get some, some interfaces, but it's gonna be far down the road and potentially not possible. Uh, quick quick tangent <laughs> yeah i'd love to do to to have like a separate discussion with you on that but you know maybe some other time whenever you're free uh yeah. so douglas um bef uh, b so what what interests me could, uh, when when you guys when you and your team went into the you know development of the hardware wallet bitbox uh it's just called bitbox or bitbox zero two mm -hmm. um like what was it like? Did you did you have a look at other hard wallets? Did you look at like mm -hmm. cryptography, like uh, secure elements issues? Uh, what what was your approach there? To yeah, so um, this touches into a bit of my my background also. So when I first got into Bitcoin, uh, maybe like most people, the first thing I tried to do is uh, uh, see what trading is all about. Uh, coming from a scientist background, uh, try to make some algorithms to do uh, machine learning and trading things like that. I quickly realized. Um, that's a full-time job if you actually want to make money. <laughs> and so then the next step was, uh, uh, you know, after getting some some Bitcoins, it took me about a week uh, until I actually felt comfortable holding it because uh, I kind of had a bit of a grasp of the security concepts around it. Uh, and so um, at the time, the, the concept of hardware wallets uh, existed, uh, but there was nothing on the market. Uh, so Trezor, Trezor and Ledger were... Um, you know, making some posts, making some noise, but nothing was, was available. Um, also at the time, uh, if you recall, there was a, uh, a big, um, I don't know what the right word is, uh, 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 boost in like mining equipment. A lot of people trying to sell miners and stuff like that. And there's a bit of hardware scams around with that, selling miners that actually didn't exist or selling miners that uh, the miners first used themselves and only sold after it's no longer profitable. And so uh, there's a lot of scams going around. I didn't know if the other hardware wallets would uh, actually come to market. And so I just decided in my spare time um, in the evenings to build my own. Um, and sure, I looked, I looked at what Ledger was doing, what Trezor was doing at the time. And this uh, led to um, uh, the Bitbox 01, uh, which I, I invented. Um, and uh, that actually came to market in 2016. Um, 
And when looking at that, uh, so Trezor and Ledger were the main main sources, and I decided um, for a security concept, uh, try to take the best of both worlds. So I, I have respect for, for what both the companies are doing. And I thought, okay, if I can maybe try to do something that improves on it, let's try to do that. So this is where the this dual chip architecture uh, concept came from. Uh, and what one thing that, and that persists now with the Bitbox 02, we try to improve it a lot. Um, and so try to take the best of both worlds. So Ledger, of course, has a secure element. Um, they have the code on there, but it's closed source, uh, which for a variety of reasons is is not so optimal. Um, you know, Bitcoin's all about transparency. Um, if you have closed source, you can't really verify. Um, you know, the common saying, uh, don't trust verify, uh, is a bit harder to apply. Um, and so uh, th that's on one end, but on the other hand, the secure element uh, does give you a lot of physical security uh, protection, uh, which is attractive. Trezor, um, they had a general purpose microcontroller. Uh, they did that in order to keep all of the code open source, uh, but general purpose microcontrollers just aren't uh, designed for uh, physical security. Uh, and so um, and there's some, some issues with that. And so I decided why not just take a secure element and uh, a general purpose microcontroller and combine them so I can run the code all open source on the general purpose microcontroller, uh, have transparency there, and then use the secure element not for running the, the crypto code itself, but just for um, uh, trying to protect uh, um, you know, uh, access, so hardening access into the device. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was the original mm -hmm. concept. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, just starting out, there's a lot of improvements, a lot of uh, deficiencies that we've we fixed as we've gone along. Um, and then the Bitbox 02 uh, is really uh, born out of uh, a lot of the things we learned uh, in the past, uh, a lot of the, uh, the lessons learned and the hardening that we learned and try to make it a really solid product. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, so, uh, Douglas, I mean, you know, uh, the reason I also do this podcast is because I really empathize with the, you know, with the average user out there. So, yeah. um, I mean, we've got to be honest, I mean, every hardware device, hardware wallet has some kind of potential, at least, vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, so, when I first, uh, you know, got sent one of these Bitbox Zero Two, uh, I unpacked it. Uh, the first thing I, I was impressed with is the um, was it like the vacuum packed uh, package, like uh, right? So th is mm -hmm. that the s sort of the e equivalent of a tamper proof uh, validation that you know it's an original device, you know has, hasn't been manipulated, tampered with? So and uh, you know and since I'm not a security expert, I talked to Stepan Snigirev, and he said actually there were a list of vulnerabilities, you know, all all kinds of of hardware devices, but. Uh, uh, Bitbox or Shift Crypto Security, your company actually resolved, um, according to his knowledge, all of them. So if that's great. Um, um, are there any issues where, or let's just go step by step, like, um, do you want to start like with the tamper-proof packaging or the, the validation of whether sure. it's, yeah. it's genuine or not? Yeah, yeah. so a uh, great question. Um, and em empathizing with um, um, you know, the everyday user, uh, of course. Also, uh, besides security, there's usability. Uh, and so that's one of the things we really try to focus on, uh, try to distinguish ourselves there, make it easy to use. Um, but as far as security, you know, we don't we don't want to um, lay any, uh, I'm trying to think of a, <laughs> I'm forgetting the saying. But anyways, we don't want to um, leave any stone unturned. Is that the right saying? Anyway, we want to, uh, you know, cover our bases there as, as well as we can, of course. And so the the vacuum uh, packaging, um, it does add some, uh, uh, it, it is what I guess uh, the industry would call uh, tamper-proof packaging. So we have a, a bit of a, a unique uh, design around the edge. So you should be able to identify it opens and things like that. But I would say in general, uh, that's probably a bit more, um, security theater than actual security because it's pretty easy to um, just someone to just remake uh, one of these devices uh, or one of these uh, one of these uh, vacuum bags uh, and so in that sense um, it should give like a low level indication if anyone did tamper with it uh, such as the post office uh, opening the device or, or resellers things like that uh, but it's not going to give full full guarantee uh, and so 
instead of that, we have, um, and similar to Ledger, uh, something we, we uh, were inspired by Ledger about, we have an attestation key on the device itself. Uh, and so what that means is uh, during factory installation, we program a, a secret key onto the device. And this is designed for uh, preventing counterfeiting. And so when you plug it into um, uh, your computer and you run our mobile app, it'll do a challenge response. So just to uh, test if the key that's in the device is actually uh, what it should be. And this uh, is a bit, uh, a much better way to handle, um, you know, supply chain risks and counterfeiting. Mm -hmm. yep. Great. Um, do you, uh, like, is, are there any issues like, we, we, that you really had to deal with, like cryptography, or do you have like cryptography um, team that is specialized, or did you have any kind of issues with that? Uh, yeah, sure. So crypt cryptography is, uh, of course, um, immensely uh, powerful. Uh, I'd say it's uh, quite awe-inspiring from when I first got in the field. Uh, we do have, um, have and had some uh, uh, cryptographic experts who, who studied and things like that. Um, but I would say a couple points here. One is that um, Bitcoin is more so applied cryptography. Uh, and so you're using cryptography that experts and academics have uh, developed. And one of the sayings in cryptography is don't roll your own. Uh, so don't invent your own cryptography because there's a lot of ways to, to go wrong with that. And so in general, you should use very well vetted, uh, well used, well, well reviewed uh, cryptographic libraries. Um, so like the Bitcoin uh, SecP 256K1 library, for example, the Bitcoin curve. Um, that curve has found, uh, um, in my opinion, it's probably the most uh, secure uh, cryptographic library available. It's very, very well vetted. If someone can break into it, you know, there's a huge honeypot of hundreds of billions in, in value. Um, and that's even found uh, uh, by analyzing that code and comparing it to uh, existing like OpenSSH and other um, uh, very common cryptographic uh, libraries, they found bugs in those libraries too. Uh, and so um, that's that's one aspect, don't roll your own. So you don't really have to be, um, uh, you, you don't really need like academic level cryptographers uh, to use, uh, to, to make tools that use um, uh, Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's a lot of core devs that are uh, behind that uh, and, you know, making the right decisions. And so we use the tools that they, they recommend for sure. Uh, that said, of course, it's important to um, have, have knowledge on the team and we do uh, in order to try to pay attention to a lot of the common, um, common pitfalls that are available. And uh, yeah, and, and like that. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say, I mean, if, if you were talking to a new, but, you know, event, uh, a fresh Bitcoin user, and you wanted to, you know, to, to make some, you know, weighing off trade-offs, which kind of hard wallet, I mean, I'm not saying like, you know, what, what would you be your pitch, but how, how would you compare that? Like, how, what would you, what would you explain to that noob? Like, what is so special about, about the Bitbox 02? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, first of all, assuming that, um, uh, they understand the importance of hardware wallets in general, as opposed to keeping it on exchanges or on your phone. Uh, big issues there. Um, then, sure, there's a there's a few hardware wallets out there. Uh, what makes us unique um, is a, a great question. So, we think that we have quite strong advantages uh, in the two main areas of usability, uh, but also in terms of security. Uh, and probably if you talk to any hardware wallet vendor, they'll think that they have the best um, uh, security model uh, as we do. <laughs> uh, we think that. Um, we also try to be quite quite open about it. So if you go to our website, you can see um, a section on threat models. Uh, so what's in scope, what's out of scope. Uh, I think it'd be really great if other hardware wallet vendors would also have um, um, Oh, sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. There's no background. Yeah. So that's... Yeah, if you go to if you go to Bitbox02, mm -hmm. and then there will be security features and threat model. Oh. Okay. If you if you scroll up, there's actually a sub a sub menu. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so just, just a highlight of the security features that we have and, and the threat model. And we just recently also came out with a, a blog post, I think just a day or two ago, uh, that also tries to explain in common language uh, what our security concept is. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to go into details about, about both of those, uh, but that's, that's kind of um, uh, uh, some, some information that uh, people can check out. Um, since we're on um, the security topic, mm -hmm. yeah, so you can scroll through there, you can see different types of scenarios. I think this is also quite educational uh, for, for new users just to understand what different types of threats exist uh, right. in the field. And so, you know, Bitcoin, uh, it's, it's great in the sense that you can be your own bank, that's super powerful. You know, one, one thing we're really um, passionate about is uh, equipping individuals so that they can participate, so that they can have financial uh, independence, financial sovereignty. Um, and hardware wallets, I think, are, are a way in that direction. Um, and, but the, the, the trade-off there is that if you're your own bank, then you know, banks have security, right? So you have to be your own security team also. And I think this is where hardware wallets are very important. Um, they take a lot of this burden uh, for you uh, and try to do it really well. Um, so uh, with our security model, um, I mentioned before the dual chip approach uh, compared to Ledger and Trezor. I would say one thing um, that I think uh, that we're proud of a bit is the, the concept beyond that in the sense that um, uh, we try really hard to do security in depth. Um, and that means like, uh, if there's uh, different aspects involved, like a secure chip or MCU, uh, we wanna make it such that a failure of any one um, component will not lead to a failure of the security model for the others. So even if the secure chip doesn't do what's anticipated, if there's a manufacturer backdoor in it or whatever, um, your coins will still be protected. Um, and one way we do this is um, by requiring three different pieces of information in order to um, access your coins. And so that's first a uh, secret on the secure chip. And as I mentioned, it's, it's specifically designed to keep um, you know, physical protection of secrets in the chip. Uh, there's also a secret on the MCU. Uh, and there's a third secret, which is not on either thing, which is uh, your password to use. And so all three of these pieces of information are cryptographically combined and only then will you be able to access uh, your coins in your wallet. And so even if someone steals your device, there's not enough information on the device to actually recreate your wallet and uh, access your coins. And so I, I think this is quite, quite um, uh, as, far, as far as I understand, quite novel and quite um, a special way to do it. And we're, we're quite, we think it's a, it's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, usability, on the other hand, you know, you can make something as secure as possible, uh, but it doesn't really matter if no one's able to use it. And so we spend a lot of time trying to think of, you know, how, how to make things simple. Um, and so when we created the Bitbox 02, um, you know, we tried to take some lessons learned from uh, the Bitbox 01 that included simplicity. Uh, so we got really great reviews about um, uh, the onboard SD, micro SD card. Um, the point here is to make it really, really simple to, to do a setup and do backups. So it takes uh, just minutes, whereas with the others, it'll take um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. One of the can feedback... You, yeah. Can you explain the micro SD card? I think for the average user out there, why, why a micro SD card? Mm -hmm. So um, one, of the, one of the feedback we got from uh, our reseller partners and other users uh, was this concept of mnemonic anxiety. Um, and so a mnemonic is the traditional way to do a backup. So a mnemonic is just a word list that represents a random number. And typically with any wallet, software wallet or hardware wallet, you have to get a list of 12 to 24 words. You write them down on a piece of paper. Uh, and then uh, that's, that's basically your backup. Uh, and what we did was we used a micro SD card slot on board the device itself. And instead of forcing users to write down this word list, it's just saved instantly uh, onto the micro SD card. And then the idea is you take the micro SD card out and you, you keep it somewhere safe. Uh, if you have a lot of funds, maybe you make um, a couple of different copies and put them in different locations. Uh, and the mnemonic anxiety was from users who didn't really understand 
uh, you know, what, what is a mnemonic? Why am I writing words down? Um, what do I need to do with this? And people are really scared making sure they do every word right. And when they have to re-enter the words in to verify that what they did correctly, it takes a long time. Uh, it's a lot of stress. And so we want to take all that away. Um, that said, you know, some people uh, trust uh, paper uh, a bit more than uh, electronics, although uh, micro SD cards are quite quite stable. Uh, so we also give the, the option to uh, create a, a mnemonic word list um, that you can write down on paper too during the setup. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what I like about that you mentioned, you know, um, since, you know, we all, I mean, most of us are not any kind of technical experts and we need somewhere we need to trust. I mean, it's, it's funny yeah. because Bitcoin is about trustlessness, but you got to start somewhere like, okay, you got to start trusting the hardware manufacturer. But when you're saying, okay, you know, you need sort of three hardware components, as I would just call them, in order to, you know, verify the validity or whatever the 100%, uh, uh, you know, confirmation thing is, um, yeah, it's somehow, uh, re um, it's a comfortable thought, you know, it's, yeah. it's relaxing. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for sure, one of our uh, guiding principles has always been to try to minimize the need to trust anything, anyone, including us. Uh, and so requiring or the, the device password, which the user itself sets, is one aspect to try to uh, uh, let users not have to trust us. Uh, I think open source comes into play here again. Uh, so our code is all open source. Uh, so peop anyone can go take a look at it. Uh, we have deterministic builds, which means that um, an individual can build the code itself themselves and they can um, uh, verify that what we actually distribute is identical to what they built. So the code we publish is really the code on the device um, and so on. But as you said, you know, it's, it's hard to eliminate all trust. Uh, in the end, you still have to have some trust uh, to the hardware manufacturer because um, even with all this, you could still have, uh, you know, uh, a second chip on the device that's doing something backdoor. that you don't know, Is a backdoor the... somehow, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Uh, and so we we try to do everything we can to um, uh, not have people trust us, including releasing like X-ray schematics, X-rays and schematics of our our devices. Um, but if any if any of your listeners have other ideas uh, for things we can do, we're happy to hear also. Right. Um, let me go back to, because you, you, a couple of times you mentioned the Bitbox 01. So it is true, right? I mean, you have, you would have um, potentially uh, more attack vectors if you don't have a Bitcoin only firmware on it. Is that true? That's true. So, so the, the Bitcoin 01 uh, is a different uh, hardware design. So it actually um, was an early one. So it didn't have a screen. Um, that was one of the main reasons we um, uh, moved on to the Bitbox 02. Um, but as you mentioned, we have, um, with the Bitbox 02, we have two versions. One is the Bitcoin only version and another is, um, uh, what we call multi edition. So you can have, uh, altcoins on it. You can also have, um, uh, second factor authentication using the, the FIDO, uh, U2F protocol. Um, but the Bitcoin only version, uh, a lot of people ask us, okay, why, why did you do that? Uh, because the multi already has Bitcoin and things like that. Uh, there's a few reasons. Um, the main one is also against security. Uh, so, so like you mentioned, uh, it reduces the attack factors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anytime you add uh, new code, so altcoins need new code, U2F needs new code, you introduce different ways, uh, different API um, settings and different ways that people can interact with the device that introduces potential for uh, different attack factors and different ways to attack the device. Uh, and so by just eliminating that, trying to keep it as minimal as possible, um, you automatically uh, will, will uh, wipe out a lot of those, uh, uh, sec those um, different types of attacks. Uh, and so that's why uh, we made the Bitbox 02 Bitcoin only uh, for added security. Um, and yeah, we had um, um, during the, uh, the beta release, we also had a questionnaire uh, asking users, you know, are, would they be interested in the, in the Bitcoin only also? And we got a lot of uh, positive feedback uh, 
quite quite significant portion of users uh, were actually interested in in the Bitcoin only, uh, which made us feel good, and um, uh, and also it bears out in the sales statistics. Also, a significant portion mm -hmm. of people do do appreciate this extra security. Yeah, it was definitely uh, you know really good decision because. Uh, you know, I, I like Trezor. It's just that um, I mean, I've been using Trezor too, and 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 uh, the problem with Trezor, I think, uh, has been, and I reported that to their team, to their security, or yeah, uh, is that first of all, um, they don't have a. Uh, I'm not sure by now. Do they does Trezor even deliver Bitcoin only uh, hardware wallets? I'm not even sure about that. But the one I've had is that uh, the problem has been that every time you update, you make an update. Uh, you have to do this uh, Bitcoin only firmware again, you know, so uh, you do you need to do this extra separately mm -hmm. after each up, uh, update. So I'm not sure whether that's a bug or um, or they just didn't think of it, but it, it makes it a little bit not practical in a sense. So that's why I think it's good if, if a company, you know, delivers Bitcoin only uh, hardware devices to the yeah. to their customers. Yeah, one, one thing we did um, uh, was you know, a, di a bit different to Trezor. So they have a Bitcoin only firmware, which I think is great. Uh, but we, what we did was we actually made a Bitcoin only wallet. And so um, the Bitcoin only uh, hardware can only ever load Bitcoin only firmware. Mm -hmm. and we thought that was important. So there's different signing keys and so on that would prevent um, uh, the different version from being loaded onto it. Um, and again, this is, you know, uh, preventative security, I would say, such that, you know, if any any bug comes uh, in the future by someone figuring out they could use something that was uh, an issue with the altcoin support or the U2F support, um, we'd want to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Great. So the Bitbox 02 comes, uh, you know, with this whole vacuum package, uh, tamper-proof packaging, and and uh, once you, did you ever hear from your, or like, did you get any kind of feedback from your, from your customers? Uh, in terms of the haptic touching of it, because I thought always I have like big fingers or something like, yeah. uh, but then I got used to it. After a while, I really got used to it. It was, it was easy, really, like, really a piece of cake after that. But what's, what's the feedback you get from your, I mean, if, if you can share that. Yeah, sure. So um, also is, I just want to mention uh, first, like as far as user feedback, we're very, very happy to get user feedback. You can send us uh, emails to support at shiftcrypto.ch. Uh, we also, right now on our Twitter, um, we have a questionnaire uh, up, uh, shiftcryptohq at Twitter. Uh, if you can uh, go and fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. And we're very happy to, to hear what users say. Uh, as far as uh, the, the touch buttons, uh, the touch sliders that we have on the Bitbox O2, this is something unique for us. We don't have physical buttons. Instead, on the side of the device, uh, there's two touch sliders on the top and the bottom. And um, uh, just, just to explain the, explain the concept, and they can be used as a slider to scroll. They can also be used as uh, reconfigured to be touch buttons for a touch press. Uh, for secure um, uh, operations, we have a hold, uh, hold function. So you basically clamp it with two fingers uh, to confirm a transaction, for example. And the feedback we got from this, mm -hmm. oh yeah, somewhere there's some animated GIFs, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, if you scroll down, yeah, if you put your cursor over the the line drawings, I think it'll actually move. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, nice. So some of the different options. Mm -hmm. And um, the feedback we've gotten has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, when we first released it there, with the beta program, there was some um, calibration issues, but those are now fixed. Um, and the feedback we get is, is really, really great. So uh, some people, it's it's very new. It's a very unique kind of uh, way to interact with, with the device. Um, so it takes a little while to uh, kind of grasp the concept, but you get it pretty quickly. Uh, and then once you get it, um, it's quite fast. And so we think, uh, we originally came up with this um, kind of design for uh, flexibility, uh, but also we think you can have some really interesting uh, and good user experience uh, with it. And so with respect to um, actually just using a hardware wallet for a hardware wallet, uh, we think you can have much faster um, input 
uh, for example, the password entry, uh, we think you can do it much faster than the others, so easier. Uh, and we think when you display information, it's a lot more um, uh, quicker, quicker to grasp, simpler to use. Uh, and so um, this is one, one aspect along with the micro SD cards where we're trying, trying really hard to focus on um, simplicity. And that includes, you know, we haven't even mentioned it with the software, of course, a lot of uh, focus there, but also on the hardware level itself, we want to make mm -hmm. things very simple. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether I tested recovery um, um, from in the beginning, but uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure, okay, so uh, the, the, uh, the seed phrase or the monomic phrase is on the micro SD card. So if I wanted to do a recovery test, I'll just take out the, uh, you know, retrieve my whatever, my, my micro SD card, put it into the device, right? Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, and so um, once you uh, reset your device or you get a new device, um, so the, the backup can be loaded on any device, so you can get an extra device if you wish. Um, if if some if you lose one or it gets damaged. Um, and yeah, uh, during the setup process, it'll just give you an option, create a new wallet or load from a backup. And it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I, um, I did test both ways because uh, the whole package comes with a that's what i was going to say uh, with a extra what do you call it like adapter cable or plug-in cable for the mobile phone for the android so i tested both you know desktop and mobile it works really smoothly would there be is there a difference <laughs> when you interact with your mobile like are there any potential attack vectors or security risks when you do it with your mobile just really plain uh, you know question yeah, so um, the whole point of a hardware wallet is, um, uh, uh, of course, keep your coin safe. But one, one assumption that all hardware wallet vendors make is that your computer or your mobile phone is already compromised. And so part of this uh, threat scenario um, is that uh, the hardware wallet should protect against uh, any malware that's on your computer or your mobile phone. So in that sense, uh, there shouldn't be a difference. Um, and because um, we, ju we just automatically assume it's already already hacked. Uh, and so, and then that's why you have a screen, that's why you have touch input, things like that, so that you can verify that what you are signing, what you are doing is really what you expect that you're doing. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, there shouldn't be a difference. Uh, and yeah, and we do, we do provide the uh, the Bitbox with uh, different cables. So it's, uh, uh, by default, it's a USB-C connection. So with modern or new computers, new phones, it should plug in directly. Uh, we also have an adapter for um, the traditional USB-A uh, port, and we have an extension cable also. And so we try to, uh, again, with simplicity, we try to provide all the tools, all the accessories necessary, such that once you get the device, you can be up and running. You don't have to uh, go order more parts to make it work with your system. Mm -hmm. You know, on all the hardware devices, there's this option and there's this talk about like, like uh, uh, choose an additional 25th uh, pass uh, phrase word, mm -hmm. you know, additional to the monomic, the 25th word, a pass phrase. Uh, what would you tell the, the average is like, why should they do that? Or should they do that at all? Yeah, so, um... I, I'm always hesitant to give recommendations on best security practices, <laughs> but uh, the 25th password is uh, an extra layer of security. So you, basically a second, a second password. Uh, one of the really nice things I think about the, this 25th word, um, this extra passphrase is uh, the ability to have plausible deniability. Uh, and so what that means is, um, for example, let's say, um, uh, there's a thief, um, they're standing next to you uh, and they have a gun pointed at your head and they want uh, um, you to open up your wallet and give them all your coins, for example. Um, or uh, maybe uh, uh, um, a situation that could happen more and more in the future is uh, not a thief, but maybe a government, for example, at an airport, you get to a checkpoint. Uh, in the US, for example, there's, there's laws where um, if someone asks you to uh, give a secret to decrypt something, you have to. Um, otherwise, they can 
you know, not let you in the country, but maybe do some other things. Um, and so I think uh, these scenarios uh, are an issue and plausible deniability means you could uh, deny plausibly uh, that you have coins on your device. And so the 25th word, um, how it works with that is you can enter any word or any random string uh, and it will create a completely valid wallet. Um, and if you enter the wrong string, it'll be a valid wallet, but no coin on the device. If you wanna make it a little bit more plausible, you could set up a second uh, wallet with a different password, a different um, 25th word, uh, put a few coins on it, put a few transactions on it, uh, and then uh, have that to show uh, to potential people, um, and then keep the rest of it locked away somewhere a mm -hmm. bit more secret. All right. So, um, but it's important to emphasize that one should never ever forget or lose the 25th word, right? Yes, <laughs> that's a very good point, yeah. Okay. yeah. Probably right. more coins have been lost by um, people's brains, people's memory, than um, uh, actual um, technical issues or sec actual security issues. Yeah, yeah, it's a real paradigm shift. I think the thinking of being one's own super self-sovereign Bitcoin citizen, that it really means self-responsibility. I mean, yes, for right. sure. Yeah. yeah. So one feature I think, or one uh, really uh, good or, or unique feature of of um, a Bitbox Zero Two is that, um, like, even if someone had physical access to the device itself without the micro SD card there's no way they can retrieve that, right? With highly sophisticated technologies, whatever, right? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, um, it doesn't have enough information on the device to actually recreate the wallet uh, by uh, cryptographically including the user password. Um, but uh, despite that also, uh, there is you know, this idea of security in depth. Uh, so we try to make it really hard for uh, someone to actually extract the secrets. Uh, so they could potentially brute force uh, the password, uh, but they need the secrets stored in the MCU, the, the microcontroller, and also in the secure the secure chip. Mm -hmm. um, and the secure chip um, has a couple of brute force pre prevention mechanisms. Uh, so the secret inside of there, it's developed, or it's, sorry, generated inside the secure chip, stored inside the secure chip, uh, should never leave the secure chip. Um, uh, by, by design. And when um, um, someone would try to, for example, brute force your password, they have the device, they need to use the secure chip in order to act, to use the secret. Um, and uh, there's a couple of brute force prevention mechanisms included, including uh, making it take time to make an attempt. Um, I don't have the numbers off my head, but it'll take um, hundreds or thousands of years to actually uh, brute force uh, a rather short password. Um, and in addition, uh, it has a, a monotonic counter inside the device, uh, which means that after uh, about 700,000 attempts, um, which is a big number, uh, so you should never run out of attempts, uh, but it's a small number compared to um, the brute force space. Um, the device itself will lock and mm -hmm. it'll be unusable after that point. Um, so I, maybe that was uh, kind of where, where you're heading. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got not your coin, not your keys, not your coins, and now let's go progression level. Uh, let's talk about like connecting, because I had, a, I had some issues at the beginning. I don't know what I did wrong, or maybe I, I didn't follow the precise instructions. I didn't get, you know, how to connect. Because I got a my node full node, uh, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's a progression. So you, you know, so people should learn yeah. first of all take their take the Bitcoin off the exchange, put it in a hard wallet like Bitbox Zero Two, and then the next step should be connecting it uh, uh, to an independent uh, self. Uh, what do you call it? Self verifying, self validating full node. Yes. And um, is there anything you want to like um, explain to people, like what what they need to take care of when when connecting your Bitbox Zero Two to whatever proxy or, or, or full node? Yeah. So um, the so j just taking a step back. So um, uh, the reason for full nodes. Um, 
yeah, it's, as you said, uh, it's kind of the next step in the progression. Um, taking control of uh, uh, your private keys, basically. So hardware wallets, they provide uh, security, but they don't provide privacy. And so one thing a lot of uh, new people and, uh, and even experienced people don't, don't quite um, grasp right away is that even if you're using a hardware wallet or a software wallet, um, you know, your coin balance is on the blockchain. And so you need to use some kind of software even if you have a hard wallet, you need to use some kind of software in order to uh, check the blockchain to see how many coins you have. And so um, if you're using uh, you know, Ledger, Trezor, ourselves also, uh, you have to ask the, the wallet to get uh, your coin balance. And so each of us will have our own um, uh, servers, our own nodes uh, that will give you this information. Uh, but that means, uh, I don't think any of us is doing this, but that means if, if we wanted, we could uh, basically look and see your whole financial history. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of antithesis to what, what Bitcoin is. And so uh, for two years now, um, we've offered uh, the opportunity to connect to your own full node uh, through our app. Uh, and so in that case, you don't have to trust uh, any other third party um, to, to check how many coins you have for you. You can do it yourself. Um, and um, so we think that's that's quite important. Uh, that's why we did it so early, uh, and we're continuing to improve um, the usability here. For example, we'll have um, uh, I think our next our next firmware release, our next uh, app release, will also have improved Tor support, uh, so that you can use um, uh, Tor a lot more easily to connect to your own. Um, no. Are you sure you don't have it already? Because I thought wait, wait. I was, I'm, I'm using, I've been using uh, the Tor address actually of yeah. my. So that, that, that might've been why you had a little bit of trouble. So Tor is possible. It's been possible for a long time. Um, but there's some issues with, uh, uh, I forget exactly, like SSL uh, certificates, for example. And now we've um, kind of had a way to work around that. So you can connect to the Tor. Uh, exactly. More, and then it directly. generates the certificate automatically and then it checks yeah. and then connection successful. I think that's how it works, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember the exact details, but there should be a lot more uh, streamlined uh, so that you can use Tor and a full node to have full full uh, privacy. And I would say uh, one of the key components to full financial sovereignty. Great, yeah. And so, and then we use the, the Electrum protocol. So it's very easy to connect to your own backend, uh, like the Raspberry Bolt or Raspberry Blitz, my node, Nodal, they're all supported. Uh, and this should work even on mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It would just be great if, if, you know, for really the, the average user out there that would just, uh, you know, the, my, my note already has you know, really beautiful guidelines and instructions to follow. And it would be nice, you know, if, if there was a little bit more, what do you call it? Like a exchange of thoughts and the communication between, you know, the hard wallets and the full node providers. And, and, you know, so people just can step by step without going into command lines or anything. <laughs> Yeah, uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we think we think there's a there's a market there also um, where it's something we're interested in pursuing. But at the moment, we're focused trying to focus uh, on hardware wallets and make mm -hmm. sure we do that right. Right. So, uh, yeah, um, I don't have any more questions. Um, uh, is there anything on the roadmap uh, you want to share with us or? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we're all, always working. There's a lot in the pipeline. Uh, um, you know, in, in general, we're always hard at work trying to improve the user experience. Um, I think, you know, with better onboarding, we can enable the, the next generation of Bitcoiners to hold their own keys. Um, and we think that's very important. Um, just in general, so we mentioned the, the mobile app on Android. Uh, that's been in, in beta for a while, um, but that's going to be coming out of beta. So we're happy about that. Um, we are also quite interested in, in integrations with, with other... Um, uh, other wallets, other services, uh, Electrum, for example. Um, we have a, uh, there should be a new Electrum release coming out soon, and that will include support for the Bitbox O2. Mm. Um, okay. And that will also include, uh, you can use the Bitbox O2 with uh, multisig uh, on that also. So we're quite excited about that. Um, multisig will come to our own app later down the line. Um, yeah, and so as as far as uh, integrations, um, you know, we're quite happy to uh, 
you know, do more integrations. So if you think your service or um, a wallet can benefit from uh, hardware wallet integration, uh, please reach out to us. We're happy to hear from you. Uh, and in general, um, yeah, we're, we're going to have, uh, uh, for example, HWI uh, support in probably the next release after this. Uh, so that's the hardware wallet interface um, uh, be develop being developed by Bitcoin Core um, contributors. Uh, and that should, should give automatic access to Wasabi, uh, BTC Pay Vault, and so on. Uh, so we're quite excited about that. Uh, but, but like I said, if anyone also has uh, some ideas or integrations that they're thinking about, please do contact us. Great. Any other resources you want to direct? Like uh, you mentioned the, the, the survey that pe people can fill out or the website or whatever you have. Yeah, we're, we're always happy for, for user feedback. Uh, we value it immensely. Uh, like I mentioned, we have um, a survey, a questionnaire right now uh, pinned on our Twitter, uh, our Twitter uh, at Shift Crypto HQ. And for general information, uh, check out our website, shiftcrypto.ch, and we'll continue to update that to give you more and more information. And uh, also from there, you can find a link to uh, a number of blog posts we've done, uh, which uh, I'd say can be educational also for um, uh, technical people. For example, um, uh, we had some posts on uh, the pitfalls of multisig that have been quite popular, um, some posts on nodes, um, and so on. Fantastic. Douglas, thank you so much. And yeah, uh, yeah we might have some, some other talk maybe on Euromains <laughs> and Bitcoin in the future. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> All righty. Thanks All so right. much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Bye bye. All right. That was a really fascinating talk with Douglas Buckham, CEO of uh, Shift Crypto. Uh, dot ch uh, the makers producers of uh, bitbox 02 uh, uh, hardware wallets bitbox 02 because it's a bitcoin only firm uh, uh, hardware and check them out it's really uh, smooth haptic you know interaction with the hardware device it uh, one feels comfortable secure relaxed and uh, you can only you know just uh, ma make up your own opinion uh, do your own due diligence uh, read about it uh, share this video um, with others, retweet it, like it, share, subscribe, follow, and make sure you follow them on uh, Twitter and on the website. Uh, Douglas is uh, at Douglas Buckham, and uh, the website is shiftcrypto.ch, and there you can find them also on Twitter. That's Shift Crypto HQ. Okay, so that's all about it. Uh, Hope you've enjoyed this. Let me know if you have any questions, feedback, and any other wish for a special guest. You uh, should join me on my on my show, Total Bitcoin Podcast Show, or on my Total Bit Connector Show. Thank you so much again for your support for listening. I'll see you soon again. Bye.